I miss hanging out with my brother. We come from an athletic family, and before he used to eat, breathe, and crap out of a tube, he loved skiing. Something I was never particularly crazy about, compared to soccer or boxing, which he also enjoyed. His friends had taken him to Colorado for spring break while he was a sophomore in high school, and he proved a natural. The Christmas that followed, he was gifted with his very own pair of skis. Now, they're stashed in some dark and cluttered corner of the garage. It's too unbearable to look at the dark reminders of his last ski trip. The winter of my second year in college, Tim cast the idea in my direction, and I bet. Tim asked randomly. You like skiing in Wisconsin, right? Yeah, I had a good time, I replied, and I wasn't lying. I had gone the year before, the feeling of being able to glide seamless across the ground without having to move your legs is awesome in the true sense of the word. Tom looked noticeably excited as he explained how he had I talked to mom and she said the tickets are pretty cheap and we could fly out to Colorado for a few days during spring break to ski on the Rockies. What do you think? Since college, my biggest regret was not spending more time with my brother. Hell yeah, bro. Let's do it. I told him, matching his smile. The plane was in the air all of two hours before we arrived. In actuality, the state is much flatter than one would probably assume. I remember asking my brother where all the mountains were. You just wait. We got to get to Denver first. Tim said. And then Buckenbridge, I asked. Tim laughed, shaking his head. Breckenridge, dummy. Yeah, I know. I was just teasing you. For sure. The day we arrived, we made it to Breckenridge in time to ski for a few hours. Just Tom and I. Now, the mountains reached breathlessly far into the sky, blocking out the horizon in every direction. So grand they seemed fake, as if a giant had plastered green screens in the distance and was projecting images of mountains rather than the real thing. By the time the lifts closed, I realized how unprepared I was for the steep slopes Colorado had to offer, and Russ was waiting for us at the hotel. Russ had taken Tim on his first ski trip. They'd been friends since seventh grade. I think the reason he's always been a gigantic jerk is the fact his parents are filthy rich. He was the cliché brat that never got told no. And if he did, his parents would change your mind with their paper seduction. That night, Tim somehow convinced my mom to let us, Tim, Russ, and myself, go off on our own to the ski resorts about an hour away. A year after this incident... Mom would break down into tears about how letting us go that day was the biggest mistake of her life, and how she would never forgive herself. We left early in the morning. Gas-choked clouds rose in plumes behind the truck Russ's family had brought. They paid someone else to tow or drive it down while they flew first class. Packed inside was Russ, driving, Tim and the passenger, and me alone in the back, along with our gear stowed in the bed of the truck. What the resort called again, and how are we getting in? I wondered aloud after some time. We seemed to be traveling deeper into the bowels of the Rockies. Both Tim and I looked at Russ for an answer while he held his gaze to the road. Russ said flatly, as if he had forgotten. Oh, I was lying. Exchanged confused looks. Tim and I spoke over each other. Dude, I told my mom we were... I fucking knew it. Oh my god, you guys should get paid for sucking the fun out of stuff. You're professionals. Russ whines to the air, and then to us. Don't you guys want to have fun? I snapped angrily at him. How about you tell us beforehand, douchebag? Yeah, how about you take off those pair of panties you're wearing, pussy? Russ said. I never usually act on anger, but there's something about snotty brats that flips a switch in me, especially if they're younger. I was the oldest in the car, but I didn't feel in charge of the situation. 
so I leaned forward and smacked him on the side of the face. A light, yet firm, solid strike. Enough to damage his ego. Russ jerked the wheel in response, nearly sending the truck off an embankment and smashing through the frozen lake below. Tim gripped his seatbelt tightly, gasping, Jesus! With smoldering eyes, Russ whipped his head around and burned me with his stare. I wasn't phased. We both knew he couldn't do anything to me. Russ had seen me wrestle in high school. He wouldn't have lasted five seconds. I challenged Russ's eyes with my own, while Tim played peacemaker. Chill. We've been driving for like half an hour. We finally got Mom off our ass, right? He gestured in my direction. Russ, you should have told us. That's not cool. Just tell us where we're going. Russ turned around and Indian burned the steering wheel while he muttered. My dad knows some guys who owns a ski resort that got shut down. It was open real early into Colorado's skiing era, but shut down real quick too. Property never got taken by the government for some stupid reason, and the land never sold neither. Eventually ownership got passed down to this dude my dad knows. Anyway, my dad paid this guy to let us on and work the ski lifts ourselves. The resort covers three mountain peaks and stretches over 2,000 acres or something. Basically, we get to ski three mountains alone with no lift lines. It'll be fun. He almost spat the last sentence out, but I was distracted. My youthful spirits nearly getting the best of me. The excitement of the idea creeping along my spine, but the rational part of my brain soon lit up. I sighed. And if one of us gets hurt, or lost, or an avalanche, God forbid, when was the last time someone was up in those mountains? Then we use our phones. Crazy technology nowadays, huh? Tim remained quiet the whole time, letting us argue. I failed to notice that he didn't say a word for the rest of the tense ride. I wonder if he had wanted to go back. I wish I'd stood up for him then. Silence clung to the car until we reached the end of a side road Russ had taken from the paved main road. We parked off next to the three well-kept, shiny snowmobiles. I laughed, and Tim finally voiced his annoyance. No way, man. Anything else you feel like not sharing? He asked, while Russ pocketed the truck keys, grabbed his ski gear, and plodded to the snowmobile. Is the Pope going to be waiting for us at the base? Just grab your stuff, it's not that far from here. Russ said. He had stopped looking us in the eyes when he spoke. I can't lie, I was still feeling the pleasure I got from cracking the side of his face. Admittedly, the cure to our testy moods was the snowmobiles. After a short demonstration, we were off, racing each other and taking dangerous detours. Without realizing, we had arrived at the base in no time. A single ski lift was in view, a lone structure in a clearing surrounded by the forest we had just traversed. All right, Russ said. Get your stuff on. I'll figure out how to turn this thing on. He sounded excited, and it was contagious. We dismounted our vehicles, and Tim and I went about shoving our feet into the clunky ski boots, fitting our helmets and goggles on, pushing our hands into gloves, and finally latching our boots into the skis. While we fit our gear on, Tim tapped me on my shoulder. Are you sure you want to do this? He asked. You can get into trouble up there. I replied. I'll be fine. I was about to ask you the same thing. We've got to be careful. No one's around to help, and I don't know if phones will... Don't stress. We'll take it easy. Ain't no way I'm going to let my brother out ski me. Tim joked, but I could hear the nerves in his voice. That's not what... The lift groans to life in front of us. The seats wailed cries of metal as the convenience system yanked them forward in an eerie parade up the hill. Russ stood in the doorway, a confused look on his face. I didn't turn that on. He let us know. Tim and I chuckled, either nervously or in sarcastic disbelief. You sure you didn't bump into something in there, you clumsy bastard? Tim asked. 
We clicked our boots into our skis and slid over to Russ and the loading zone on the lift. Nah, my man, he said to himself. Russ looked back inside the same interior office of the ski lift, let a second pass, then quickly slapped all his gear on and joined us at the loading zone. We scooched forward after the next chair passed us and allowed the following chair to scoop us off our feet, settling into the worn, frayed cushioning. I looked at Tim, sat in the middle between Russ and I, and gave him a smile he couldn't see. As we steadily rose, the mountains ahead loomed tall, getting closer by the second. The peak that this lift would bring us to was the second largest of the three, but by no means was it small. It looked like a straight shot down, a singular path wide and borderless by trees on both sides. It was all pristine white. No obstacles, no bumps or moguls, and best of all, no people. To the left of this peak, I was beginning to see the crest of the smallest mountain. Strangely, there weren't any visible trails on it. The entire mountain sported an afro of evergreens sprouting out of what seems to be every square foot. Finally, the behemoth. Easily clearing the height of the first two, the last and largest mountain was about to pierce the stratosphere and leak oxygen out into space. That's what it's like to be that high up. The air seems to slip out of your lungs and into the void. It was so steep that I decided that I would avoid that mountain at all costs, if I valued my life. Did you get a map of the place? Tim turned stiffly towards Russ. At the top of this lift, there's a sort of mini office lodge thing the ski patrol team that used to work here used. Should be in there. Russ answered. We were three quarters up the mountain now, the unload station now in view. I asked him how old the resort was again. I think he said 1930s-ish. I think he said this is one of the first places ski lifts were used after they were invented. Russ said, disinterested as if that wasn't a genuinely interesting piece of information. He pulled out his phone, opening Snapchat. Damn, Russ said suddenly. He turned his phone off and shoved it into his pocket. Service is getting wonky. I thought you said we could call. I started angrily, but Tim spotted what would end up being the terrifying start of our trip into these godforsaken mountains. Hey, when did that guy get on? Tim interrupted and pointed behind us. Russ and I twisted to get a good look. In the seat directly behind us was a skier. As a skier, the most important aspect of your trip is your clothing. Without the proper winter jacket, snow pants, gloves, boots, balaclava, hats, helmet, and goggles, your time on the mountain can shorten substantially due to the elements. If you wear all these things, not a single piece of your skin will show. Completely covered by the baggy snow clothing protecting you from the cold, unless you choose to remove your gloves or lower your balaclava or goggles. The skier that sat approximately 25 meters away from us was completely covered in his winter clothes. His garb was normal, gray jacket with black helmet, balaclava and gloves along with his fat boots strapped to blue skis. He didn't move at all, only swayed with the seat as it jostled up the hill behind us. When did he get on? Did you guys see him at the bottom with us? Tim asked nervously. I don't know. He might have snuck up on us or been waiting, Russ said. He was trying to rationalize it, but we all were probably thinking the same thing. For this skier to have been able to load on the seat following us, he would have had to have been close enough for us to notice. He's trespassing, you know, Russ added. Technically, aren't we trespassing, too? I countered. Hey! Russ called, not shouting, but with a raised voice. You're not supposed to be here! The irony in those words tickled me, but as soon as Russ directed his voice towards the skier, the skier's head jerked up. Caught off guard and thoroughly disturbed, Russ immediately shut his mouth and swallowed dryly. Tim now looked straight down at his skis, silent. The skier's movement was almost normal. There was something off about the speed and fluidity of them. 
I've never been able to place my finger on exactly what. Suddenly, the offload station was ten feet away. Look out! Tim noticed first. He scooched forward and pushed himself off the seat, sliding out. Russ did the same without incident. But when I tried, a split second too late, the seats turned, hitting me in an awkward spot behind my knee. I buckled, and I felt an abnormal shift, but no pain. I crumpled and fell on my ass. I was then aware of what was approaching me from behind, the chair drawing closer to the unloading station. Soon, I would be face to face with the featureless skier. For some reason, even though the skier had done nothing hostile except look in our direction, I just knew I couldn't let him get closer to me. Somewhere in my primate brain, my intuition told me that danger was present. Russ was beelining for the ski patrol lodge she had talked about, a small shack some thirty meters away. I always loved my brother for coming back from me then. He yanked up, steadied me onto my skis, and together we sped after Russ. I heard the skier unload behind us as we approached the door to the lodge which Russ had already entered. Not chancing a look until I was inside, I slammed the door behind us and peeled the curtain back on the nearest window. Nothing. No skier. Not another soul in sight. If not for the terrifying experience, I would have appreciated the view. We were on top of the mountain now, and everything looked miniature from up there. The quiet that had blanketed the inside of the shack was broken eventually by nervous laughter. We dismissed the skier as a friend of the owner, desperate to ease the fear we all felt. Russ told us to get looking for a map. The interior of the space wasn't much. It was essentially a very large living room, a couch to the left when you walk in set against the back wall, an ugly rug displayed noticeably off-center on the floor, and a variety of desks and cabinets scattered around. The only other door beside the exit was one that led to the bathroom in the far corner. It didn't take Tim long to find a map of the resort. Got it, Tim announced. On the opposite end of the room, Russ and Tim huddled around the pamphlet map while I studied the book I picked up off a lonely desk in the corner by the bathroom. While the younger boys talked about the best routes to take, I was busy opening the large book and pulling the long scroll-like sheet free that had been folded up and tucked firmly between its pages. Under normal circumstances, if someone had shown me what was written on it, I would have laughed. But the nagging feeling present in my stomach since the moment we arrived at the lift persuaded me otherwise. Instead, I studied the words scrawled in messy handwriting while a flower of dread bloomed in the pit of my stomach. Mountain Rules for Three Kings Ski Resort Mountain Number One One this cabin is your only haven in the resort. Be sure every window and door is always closed and secured. Always know the quickest route back here from wherever you go in the resort. This is Ski Patrol Headquarters, and where you will find help. 2. Ignore the skiers. They are mostly harmless unless directly interacted with. Avoid contact at any cost. 3. Never remove or adjust any clothing while in direct line of sight of any skier. They will know you are not one of them. 4. Be mindful, and remember the outfits your party is wearing. It is easy to lose track of friends and mistake a skier as one of them. This could be a grave error. 5. If a skier notices you, attempt to break its line of sight on you, or find a member of Ski Patrol to assist. 6. This mountain is the safest and quickest way back down to the base. It's a relatively easy black diamond, but once you start, the hunt begins. Do not let them catch you. Ski Patrol will not be able to help. Mountain number 2. 1. Never go down any trail on this mountain alone. If you do, it is best to stop skiing immediately and wait for someone to find you. Ski Patrol will routinely ski down the trails to ensure your safety. 2. 
If you notice you've been on a trail for longer than five minutes, immediately stop and cut through the forest until you reach another trail. Continue skiing from there. No trails on this mountain should last longer than five minutes. 3. If the forest begins to make noises, make your way to the mountain's lift as quickly as possible and leave immediately. If this is not possible, don't trust any sounds or voices you hear. Wait for a member of ski patrol to find you. If anyone else approaches you, flee. The forest will send imposters. 4. Do not stay on the mountain for longer than 20 minutes. You will not make it back. Mountain number 3. 1. Ski patrol does not patrol this mountain. They cannot guarantee your life, even if the rules are followed. 2. Ski at the risk of annihilation. If you choose to visit this mountain, ski slowly and deliberately. There is no room for error. 3. Total and utter silence is required. If you need assistance, do not call for help. If you are injured, do not scream. Make your way as quickly and quietly to the lift as possible, and leave. Waking Grendel up would mean the end of Three Kings Ski Resort. 4. This cabin will not protect you if Grendel follows you. Sweet, so we can start down there and jump to the top and work our way down again. Tim was tracing the map Russ now held in his hand. Guys? I called out hesitantly. You need to see this. I knew they wouldn't believe it. Who would? It's a stupid prank, or workplace gag on newbies, or the punchline of a crappy joke. But that same gnawing feeling in my gut was there as I read and reread the list. The same feeling I had staring at the skier on the lift behind us. When I fell in the unloading station and sensed the unstoppable march of death behind me, opening its frigid grasp to close its fingers around me, I should have listened to myself, made them listen too. Now I suffer with the consequences of the choices we made that day. What's up? Tim asked, walking over with Ross. They were both still engrossed in the map and barely even glanced at the list I offered to them when they reached me. Come on! Did you bring that? Russ said accusingly. I'm leaving. That finally got their attention, and they both forgot about the map for a second. I tried to continue. I didn't bring this. Being here ain't right. I know you know what I'm talking about. That skier back on the lift. If you just read these rules, they meant... What sounded like a gunshot rang out from right next to us and sent us all reeling backward. It took an extra beat to orient myself because of how bad my ears were ringing, but I was instantly aware of a cold, strong breeze blowing into the cabin. The door had flung open with a tremendous force and a skier had barreled through, scrambling desperately on all fours, although muffled to a normal volume by snow gear. I could tell the skier was screaming. Shut the damn door. They're psychos. They killed. Through the now open door, I could see three skiers approaching. The way their heads bubbled and swiveled as they skied towards the inviting entryway made me cringe. Close it! With his baklava pulled down, the skier's deep voice boomed and drove me to leap towards the door. The winds tore at my clothes as I gripped the edges and heaved, but it wouldn't budge. The skiers would be at the door in mere seconds. I remember how each of them were hunched and almost seemed to be shaking as if in anticipation. Behind me, I could hear my brother and Russ pleading with me to close the door. Crouching down, I lifted with my legs and threw my whole body into it, screaming with exertion. The skiers were close enough to touch when the door finally gave, slamming shut. I collapsed to the ground in a ball, waiting for the skiers to burst through the flimsy wood. They were too close and going too fast to have stopped in time, but the only noise outside was the wind whooping against the windows. I ran to check, but I knew what I was going to see when I looked. Nothing but the snow. They killed Jerry. Man, my boy. Man, 
What the fuck? Call the police, you... Blubbering, the man pointed at me when I turned back around. His eyes were wide, wild, and pinballed in every direction. Tim and Russ looked shocked. Their mouths hung open, and Tim looked at me like we were kids again, desperate for his big brother's help. There's no service. I held my hands up towards the hysterical man. What's your name? With their bare heads? How? His eyes were now glazed and fixed on a single spot on the ground, and he continued his mutterings. I tried to get his attention again, but he remained unresponsive. Whatever he saw, it must have broke him. I turned towards Russ and Tim with anger in my voice. Shit! Do you believe me now? No, Russ said. He wouldn't meet my eyes. But I'm getting the fuck off this mountain. He hurried over his ski equipment, taking care to trace a semicircle around the mumbling man. Tim didn't move. There was a slight shiver that racked throughout his body, and he gave me a slow nod. He believed me. Where are the rules? Asked Tim. I looked down at my empty hands. For some reason, I began to pat down the pockets on my snow pants, before turning 360 degrees in place, scanning the cabin. No. Tim was pointing out the window. I leaned over in time to see a single frayed sheet of paper whisked off the grounds by the wind and into the sky. The list, our lifeline and last hope, had slipped out the door in the confusion, and just like that, had disappeared into the air. It must have been then that I knew not all of us would make it off that mountain alive. The universal difficulty scale for ski slopes is as follows. Green circles are beginner terrain, smooth sailing and friendly to all levels of skiing, including children and the elderly. Blue squares are intermediate terrain. If you want thrills and are ready for a challenge, this is your safe zone. A black diamond means expert terrain. Your first trip down a black diamond will inevitably end with you having wiped out at least a couple times on the way down. Proceed with caution. Finally, double black diamonds are extreme terrain. Signs can usually be found at the bottom of the lifts that feed into double black slopes, stating that serious injuries and death can occur to those not experienced enough or physically able to traverse them. Obstacles and drop-offs are not marked, and it can be very difficult for any sort of help to reach you if you get stuck or injured on them. According to the map we found, Mountain Number 1 has only one very long black diamond, starting near the cabin and ending at the base of the mountain near the lift. Nausea and butterflies expanded in my belly. I had only been on a couple black diamond slopes, and only in Wisconsin, but that didn't mean much, as, comparatively, the black diamonds in Wisconsin are equivalents to the blue squares in Colorado. Tim must have noticed my dread. We were huddled by the door, throwing on our gear, and periodically checking the windows for those lifeless skiers. Russ had finished with his gear, and had plodded over to the fourth man in the room. The fourth man was a larger guy, not fat, but full, and sporting a thick black beard that looked like it was suffocating him. Motionless, focused now on a spot on the ground, he was no longer babbling about the terrible things that happened to his friend. Russ asked him from a distance. Hey, you coming? A string of drool stretched from the man's quivering bottom lip. I... Uh, we'll get help. Russ hurried back over to us. Alright, you guys ready? Yeah, man, are you? Tim replied. The three of us looked at each other. They both looked nervous, and I knew I had to at least pretend I was confident. I tried to smile and winked. I made sure my voice didn't crack when I said, We head right for the lift to take us back down. If we can't make it, just head down the slope and we'll meet at the bottom. I hesitated before adding, But try to make it to the lift. 
The rules said that when you go down this slope... Shut up already. Those weren't real. Russ snapped. There's some psychos fucking with us up here. That's it. Soon as we're in range, we'll call the police. Russ was peeking out the window, and I leaned in towards my brother. Stay close, I whispered. Tim nodded. As long as Tim and I stuck together, we would be fine, I thought. One last survey of the outside from the window. The wind had picked up slightly, swaying the trees lazily and picking snow up off their branches and flinging it through the air. There were roughly thirty meters of mountain top between us and the old lift switch was still on. A cable dragged the chairs over the slope's drop-off nearby. By the way the ground just disappears, it looked steep. I swallowed, but had no saliva available. Now. Opening the door of the cabin was like opening a portal to another world. The temperature dip was immense, and I felt bare, vulnerable. Ross bolted out into the open, hauling ass to the lift, quickly followed by Tim, gaining momentum by pushing their skis to each side as a rollerblader does. I was the only one who had brought ski poles, and I credit my survival to them, pushing myself off the ground and forward. I didn't get far before I stopped. No, get away! Rising into view over the edge of the slope were four skiers packed into an oncoming chair on the lift. Russ was trying to ski so fast, he must have been facing down and not noticed. Tim shouted in an attempt to save him. Russ, stop! As the skiers unloaded, Russ was about ten meters from the lift. I saw his head rise and his body flail to slow the velocity he had built up. His skis flew out from underneath him and Russ fell flat on his back. I caught up to Tim and grabbed his shoulder. We were another ten meters behind Russ. The memory of the rules was getting lost in my adrenaline, but I took a chance. Look at the ground and don't move, I said, hopefully loud enough for Russ to hear. The skiers were upon him then. He had been able to recover to a crouching position, hugging his knees and looking at the ground. He must have heard me, because the only movement from him was the slight shake racking his entire body. And circled around Ross, the skiers bowed their heads, almost like they were trying to get a better look at him. It twitched and wobbled as they towered over Ross. Behind them, another seat filled with skiers rose into view. Ross began to raise his head. I felt Tim urge himself forward, but I gripped his shoulder tightly and held him in place. One of the skiers twisted awkwardly and reached out a hand for Russ's face. The cry came from somewhere behind me. All four skiers immediately looked in Tim and I's direction. One bent backwards at the waist rather than turn and face us. I was paralyzed while their twitches became spasms and they bolted in a direction. I held tight onto Tim and closed my eyes, waiting for the end. Instead, I felt the air whoosh as the skiers flew past us. The one that passed closest to me was only a few inches away from brushing my coat, and I heard from under its baklava a high-pitched whining. I turned to see what, like a rabid dog, they were after, and my stomach flipped. The burly man from inside had ran out of the cabin in no skis and tried to book it across the mountaintop. I had no idea where to. Unfortunately, the ground was extremely powdery due to recent snowfall, and he was thigh deep in it, only a few paces away from the cabin. He gasped and moaned, making a considerable amount of noise while grabbing his right leg. It looked to be twisted underneath the white layer of snow. Another group of skiers barreled by us, heat-seeking missiles aimed directly at the unlucky man. Now was the time to move. Another chair delivering skiers was cresting the slope. Russ, get up! Move! I hissed at him. I shook Tim and said, Let's go! What the hell are they doing? Tim said in a shock, still watching the skiers as they approached their prey. I don't know. Don't look. Let's go. Russ was up and skiing away from us along the mountain top in the opposite direction of the screaming man. There, he headed for a trail leading off the side of the mountain into the forest. Russ, where are you going? Tim called, following him. 
follow Second Mountain Way. The wind had picked up even further, blowing the words out of Russ's mouth. We didn't need him to spell it out to get the message, though. We started off after him. Tim pulled slightly ahead, and me close behind, thanks to my pulls. The screams turned into shrieks. I turned my head back to see the fate of the poor man, and wish I never did. Impaled on a ski pole, he floated six feet off the ground, with his legs dangling uselessly. A skier held the pole, which ran through his sternum and punched a hole at his back, with his arm fully extended in the air, holding the struggling man like he was made of cotton. Blood washed down the skier's arm and created a scarlet circle beneath in the white landscape. That whining sound I heard from the skier was beginning to fill my ears until it was deafening. A congregation of skiers beneath the still very alive man made the scene look like some depraved, sacrificial rite. The throng lurched and rocked as the ringing sound reached an unholy pitch. Reaching his limits, the man gripped the pole that pierced his chest and tugged uselessly at it. He opened his mouth and blood poured out onto the goggles of his killer. Then, almost choreographed, the skiers went into a frenzy. At inhuman speed, they thrust their hands into the man's belly, puncturing his coat and skin like paper, and pulled handfuls of entrails out. Like a piñata from hell, the skiers gutted and emptied the man in a matter of seconds. It was a savage act of animals. No. Demons. Ah. Uh, Tim's head was spun around and he moaned when he saw the skiers eviscerate the man. Turn around. Go. Increasing his speed, Tim shot forward, increasing the distance between us. I tried to catch up, but looked one last time behind me. The skiers reveled in the carnage. Strewn across their feet were bones and chunks, tubes and bits of flesh slowly melting into the giant area of red snow. There were no identifying pieces left except for the head, jammed onto the top of a ski pole that stuck out of the ground. All the skiers faced our direction, their figures quivering from the euphoria. I tried to focus on catching up to Tim and Ross, but for some reason I began to worry if perhaps what lay ahead was worse than what was. Mountain number two. If I remembered correctly, this peak has a time limit on it. I mentally bookmarked it as a deceptive mountain. Don't trust what you see. Thinking of the rules flittering away in the wind made me want to curl into a ball. I turned a bend, and I could see the peak of mountain number two. There didn't seem to be any trails leading down from the small clearing at the top. Tim was quite a way ahead of me, and Russ even further. I could hear Tim shouting something and wasn't able to make out exactly what he was saying, but it sounded like he was trying to get Russ's attention. Russ didn't stop. He sped down the rest of the way to the top of the mountain and disappeared. It was strange. Nothing obstructed him from my line of sight, but upon entering the clearing, he disappeared. Tim was ready to follow and was about to speed right into the clearing after him. Tim, wait! Please stop! My vocal cords bled in my throat. He had to hear me. We didn't stand a chance if we were separated here. The first rule for mountain number two. Never go down any trail on this mountain alone. I'm not sure if he heard me or lost control, but Tim wiped out just before the trail opened into the clearing. His left ski flew off from under him, and he pitched to the side, somersaulting a few times before coming to a rest face down. In a similar fashion, I came to a crashing halt next to him, gathering myself and grabbing his coat from the back, lifting him up. You're right. He lifted his head and disposed a mouthful of slush. Uh-huh. You totally ate shit, man. Our manic laughter started with sharp barks of laughter, which evolved into wheezing and ended eventually in coughing fits. Tim recovered quickly. Stop, he said, getting back to his feet. Where did Russ go? The temporary sanctuary our laughter housed us in crumbled. Directly in front of us was the peak of Mountain Two. And yet, the only trail leading in or out 
was the one we just took from Mountain One. Did Russ have the map? I asked Tim. No, I've got it. Tim pulled the crumpled map out of his snow pants and opened it for us. The trail we were on connecting Mountain Number One and Mountain Number Two was clearly marked. The trail markings for the peak of Mountain Number Two, however, were unorthodox. Roughly 25 lines were penciled in front of the peak to different places all over the resort. It was bizarre. It looked like scribbles, but if you single one line out, it makes a deliberate path with some branching two or three times. If the map was to be believed, a few trails somehow end at a higher altitude than where they begin. I looked up from the map towards the clearing again. The forest was far too thick for anyone to ski through it. So where the hell were the dozens of marked trails on the map? Were the map makers on cocaine when they made this? Tim shook his head in mirrored confusion. But listen, fuck the map for a second, I said, turning to Tim. Those rules were real. You saw that firsthand back there. His face darkened, and I wished I could wipe that memory from both our brains. I I've been trying to remember them, but it's hard with all this shit going on. I know for sure that there's a time limit. I want to say 30 minutes, but we'll call it 25 to play it safe. I think, don't trust any noises, and don't stay on any trail for too long, and don't go down any trails alone. Tim processed the information. Russ is alone? Before I could react. Tim properly turned and skied into the clearing like he had never even been there. Tim disappeared. The only thing left of him were the impressions his skis had made in the snow, but they also disappeared at the border of the clearing. Hey! Tim's head was now floating in the air. What the hell? I flinched backwards. What are you doing? Come here! I inched forward with my poles and stuck an arm out into the clearing. If you've ever seen the Predator movies, it was similar to that. My arm melted into the background. It was the strangest feeling in the world, to feel a phantom limb but not see it. I stepped through, expecting to spontaneously combust or something, but nothing happened. The only noticeable difference was every sound was slightly dulled, like a thick blanket over speakers. Well, not the only difference. No longer were the surrounding trees too dense to ski through. Now, countless paths lined the edge of the clearing, leading into the forest and down the mountain. There's no way to explain it, but mountain number two must have had some sort of veil surrounding it, to hide its secrets to any outside observers. Which one do we take? Tim asked. We checked the map again. There was no way to exit the resort from this mountain, unfortunately. There were two ski lifts at the bottom of this peak, one leading back up to Mountain 1 and the other towards Mountain 3. Of the numerous marked trails, a singular path led to the first lift, and another singular path led to the second lift. According to the map, the rest of the approximately 25 trails led to various places around the resort, some ending on the backside of the mountain or a cliff face, or trailing off the map altogether. It was difficult tracing the paths on the map because of the branching and how crowded together they were, so we couldn't be 100% sure, but eventually we narrowed down two paths that seemed to lead us to the lift that would take us back to mountain number one. There we could regroup and find a safe way out of the resort. It had been about three minutes since Russ had disappeared into the clearing and I guessed he had picked a trail at random and sent it. Rule number eight says you shouldn't stay on a single trail for longer than five minutes. I looked at Tim and silently assumed the worst about his friend. I started a timer on my watch, and we quickly decided on one of the two paths we had chosen to go down. The trail started inconspicuously enough, but that soon changed. Within a few seconds, Cracking and grinding could be heard coming from the belly of the forest. Tim and I had agreed to keep our heads down and push through whatever we may hear. 
Tim crouched forward to pick up more speed, and I did the same. My left knee began to groan. A year back, I dislocated my patella playing soccer. The doctor explains to me that statistics said there's a 25% chance that my kneecap pops out again at some point during my life. For support during physical activity, my mom bought me a sleeve, and so far I've been without incident. As my knee began to ache, I cursed myself for forgetting my sleeve at the hotel. Warning signs of instability were beginning to show. The noises from the forest were getting very loud and very close, but I needed to slow down. I got ready to call out to Tim when the trail in front of us detonated. Snow and ice whipped through the air. A large tree had sprouted from beneath the snow at a speed so fast it practically materialized in the air. The evergreen cleaved the path in two, creating a fork, and Tim barely avoided smashing into its sturdy trunk, instead veering down the right path at the last second. I followed after him, and he slowed to allow me to catch up. We skied side by side now. There wasn't a tree there before, right? Shut up! I yelled at him. The noises continued to follow us from within the forest. Another minute of skiing, and a sign came into view. It read, New Trail, Warning, Black Diamond. The tree must have diverged us into a new trail. I guess it didn't matter what trail we started on. The mountain seems to shift and reorient itself whenever it wants. Now I was fucked. There was no way I'd be able to make it down a Black Diamond in one go. On top of that, I had no idea where this trail is leading us now. Forget finding Russ. The trail's incline began to steepen, and the terrain dipped and rose erratically. I checked the timer on my watch. 4.24. Our speed increased, and large mounds and craters in the snow layered the trail ahead. Tim hits them first, bending his knees to let his skis rise over the hills and push them down into the mounds, ensuring his skis touched the snow at all times. I did the opposite. The first mound I rode over launched me into the air. If I tried to land on my skis, I'm certain my knee would have blown out. I twisted in the air to absorb the fall with my back. Someone turned the lights off for a second. When I woke, the noises in the woods were gone. So was Tim. The watch now read. 7.48. My head ached. I had fallen halfway down the black diamond slope, and I saw a sign at the bottom signaling the start of a new trail. I had to get down there and find Tim. He must not have been able to stop on the slope for me, and was probably waiting at the bottom. I made sure nothing was broken, and started down the trail again. I had to go slow, and worked my way down in horizontal slices. After a few minutes of this, I looked up to realize I had made no progress. In fact, I somehow seemed to have gotten further away from the sign marking the bottom of the trail. I remembered the rules. Don't stay on any one trail for longer than five minutes. I looked at my watch. 9.30. That's when Billy started calling my name. Philip? Phil, where are you? How could I forget his voice? When you have a bond forged in childhood, you don't ever forget the way your best pal talks. I couldn't help myself. Billy? It barely escaped my lips, and wasn't me returning his call so much as it was remembering the way I shaped my mouth when I said his name. Like finally trying again the sport or instrument you hadn't played since childhood. Kindergarten, it must have been, when Billy asked me with defiant determination if I wanted to be his friend, like he wouldn't have taken no for an answer. Our families became extremely close, and whether it was the local baseball league or the talent show, Billy and I stuck like Velcro, refusing to participate in anything unless it was on the same team. For example, in the third grade when our families made plans to hike together through a local area of the Appalachian Mountains, we stuck together while we skipped ahead of the group. Billy pulled on his ear and made a funny face at me. Then. Billy informed me that whoever was the last one to the tree he pointed at was a rotten egg. I ran and ran as fast as I could, but Billy had pushed me right at the start, and I couldn't make up the difference. He turned the bend and must have only been ten paces in front of me as I gathered air in my lungs to pronounce that he had cheated. Instead, 
I asked. Where'd you go? No one ever saw Billy again. They searched for two weeks. Even after the time frame for finding him alive had passed, search parties continued to scour those mountains. Billy had disappeared, vanished, melted into thin air, taken by whatever gods lived in the woods there and saw fit. Phil, thank God. I got lost back there. I thought you were right behind me. You don't understand how badly I wanted to believe him. He sounded older, like he had grown into a young man just like me. But he made a point to enunciate every phoneme of every word. Billy spoke again. I knew you wouldn't give up looking for me. You're my only real friend, Phil. Bill's voice came from further in the woods than my eyes allowed me to see. Please, I begged. Come closer, Phil. I can see you, but I want you to see me. I've changed a lot. I don't think I should. The rules. They mentioned imposters. I had to get off this trail. I began to edge myself backwards towards the tree line behind him. Oh, but you just found me. Don't make me come looking for you. Billy lagged in the middle of his sentence, and the horror of hearing the inhumanity of that sound forced my body to take action. I crashed through the opposite tree line, skiing diagonally through the trees. I had to find Tim. We needed to get off this mountain. But how were we supposed to find a lift if the damn trails move at random? I checked my watch again. Fifteen eleven. We were running out of time. My watch's timer read 16.02 when I skied out of the forest into a new trail. Billy's voice followed me the whole way. I was paranoid of everything now. The way the trees seemed to make conscious movements and how the wind tried to whisper in my ear. Through all this struggle I focused, I didn't know where Tim was and I didn't remember the time correctly for this mountain. Twenty minutes. Twenty-five. Thirty. I didn't intend to wait and see the consequences of breaking this rule. Noises kept echoing out from the surrounding trees, and I did my best not to look up from the trail. Accidents like this one that caused me to separate from Tim could not be afforded anymore. Luckily, this trail was relatively level, so I coasted down to the bottom with no more accidents. It took thirty more seconds before I could hear Tim. It was my name he was calling. Something about the crispiness of his unaltered voice made me know it was him. Billy's voice had sounded damp and heavy. I found Tim hugging his knees at the end of the next trail. As soon as I hit the bottom of that trail, I turned around and you were gone. The trails shifted again. I pulled him to his feet. I'm fine. We're good now. Let's go. He nodded with worry on his face when he noticed how wild my eyes were. The best plan I could think of at the time was, since the trails moved randomly, we just needed to ski as fast as possible down each trail until we ended up at the lift. Tim asked me what if we ended up on a trail that ended off a cliff face. I told him that's a risk we must take, and one that I was more than willing to. Unlike the first mountain, mountain number two targets both your body and your mind and I don't know how much more my fragile sanity could take. We started off, practically melting the snow with how fast we burnt down the slope. It required all the concentration I had left as I identified the smoothest way down on each trail we passed through. Still, Tim pulled ahead, evidence of his superior skiing. We somehow managed to make it through another black diamond, incident-free, when our saving grace rose into view. There! Lift! Tim pointed. It was at the end of the next trail, a blue square, nothing special. I checked my watch again. 1902. A memory floated. The time limit was 20 minutes. From behind me, wood was cracking and splintering. Further up the trail, I could see the trees moving, not from the wind or any natural phenomena. No. These trees sliced through the snow like a snorkel through water. I felt a spike of lightning stab me through the nape of my neck. It must have been my body producing an extreme flight or fight reaction. There's a lapse in my memory from that moment to when we made it to the lift. 
It was there we finally saw Russ again. Wait. Tim and I stood next to the lift, maybe ten meters from the end of the trail. Russ was almost halfway down, skiing erratically and throwing his hands in the air like a blow-up in front of a car dealership. A wave of trees was crashing down upon him. They closed up the trail behind him like a zipper, slamming into each other and creating a great wall of wood as they went. There was space between Russ and the moving trees, but they were gaining. We could barely hear him, even though you could tell he was screaming like a girl. He was gonna make it through. We began to hear him more clearly. Holy shit. Holy shit. He couldn't have been more than ten meters from the end of the trail when he faltered, tipped, and tumbled into the snow. Russ! Tim pushed off his skis, heading for Russ. He was out of my reach for me to grab him. Of all the horrific events that transpired on those mountains, for some reason, this is the one that frequents my mind the most. I didn't sleep for a month afterward until I was forced to admit to myself that I can confidently say there was enough time to save Russ. He was close enough, and Tim was fast enough, but I couldn't let Tim go. All I could see were those trees eating up the path behind Russ. In a last ditch effort, I threw my ski poles at Tim's feet. One bounced off, but the other tangled between his legs and threw him off balance and onto the ground. I jumped on him and denied his attempts to get back up. He's right there. Let me go. Tim punched me hard in the jaw. My vision spilled to the side, but I wrapped my arms around his torso and used my weight to pull him to the ground again. I was able to pin his arm and start to drag him back towards the lift while he screamed the entire time. One of Russ's skis had popped off his foot. He might have been able to make it down like that but he had wasted too much time padding around the snow looking for his missing ski. When he finally got up, he had time to say, Fuck it. I'm good, guys. I made it. I'm good. Then, the forest swallowed him. The trees had caught up to him and crashed down on him with the force of a waterfall, shaking the snow from their branches and creating temporary snowfall around us. Just like Billy... The forest had decided to keep Russ. By then, I'd managed to maneuver Tim into the loading area. We had no choice but to board now. Tim wasn't screaming anymore. He wasn't moving. He allowed the chair to take him off his feet and start to lift us into the air. His ski goggles hung around his neck, and there were tears frozen on his cheek. I had to get my breathing under control. I felt like I was going to pass out. We were being carried over mountain number two, and once again there were no trails visible, just dense woods with no discernible way through. We must have been outside of the Vale again. Guys. Rosa's voice echoed out from the trees below. Tim began to search frantically over the edge of the chair. It's Russ and Phil, but we have to go back. He's, he's still there. Stop. I whispered. And yet, I was hopeful too. His voice was crisp and authentic. It really sounded like Ra's. I'll wait for you here. Please come back for me. No. They had just gotten better at imitating us. But I could still hear the flaws, the cracks and lags in their cadence. Ra's, we'll be back, I promise. Tim assured the imposter. I miss you already. There was a momentary waver in Tim's face at that, but he looked at me now, smiling. Russ is fine. We just need to get help. I stayed quiet. We were quite some distance in the air and could see the other mountains now. Below us, I was able to spot another lift line, tracing it with my eyes. I saw how it connected from the bottom of mountain number two to the peak of mountain number one. We're going to die here, man. We're fucked. I wailed. Finally, my facade shattered. There was no hope. I'm sorry, Tim, but we're so fucked. I'm sorry, dude. We're dead. Tears and snot ran slowly down my face and froze to my skin. We were on the wrong lift. 
blotting out most of the sky in front of us was the behemoth, mountain number three, waiting for us. Tim spent the rest of the lift ride trying to calm me down. Towards the end, Tim pulled out the map and tried to figure the best way down for us. After a few glances, he put the map away, quickly and without a word. The lift rose into the unloading station and Tim put his hand on my shoulder. I was still wiping icicle tears off my face. We're getting off now. It'll be fine. And Russ is waiting. Russ is fucking dead. That wasn't him. We both pushed off of our seats and skied out onto the peak. You could see everything up there. And right there was our haven. Civilization. And yet, it was so distant. I could make out houses only tiny drops in the distance, separated from us by miles of mountain and forest. The wind blew far harder, and the temperature was much colder on mountain number three. Every breath was a gasp to get as much fleeting oxygen in your lungs as possible. You heard him, Phil. He's not dead. We have to hurry. Stop it, Tim. That wasn't him. There are things on that mountain that can mimic us. I heard Billy. Billy? I insisted with my hands. Tim waved me off. That was after you hit your head, right? Come on, you heard him. That was Russ. I remember those fucking rules, Tim. There's imposters in the noises we heard. I remember. Russ is dead. I watched Tim digest this, his eyes smoldering when he looked at me again. You killed him? No. He was right there. We could have saved him. How do you know that? Fuck you, murderer. I tried desperately to appeal to him, but he wouldn't listen. But that was Tim. Too righteous for his own good. I wish I could have been the person he thought I was. I was trying to save you, and I did. I would rather have died with him. He didn't shout this. He said it blandly. This part is the most vivid to me. The way he looked at me. Not as a brother anymore. It was plain and simple. I was nothing to him now. Tim casually pulled out the map and tossed it to me before skiing some distance away and squatting. He felt like a stranger. I couldn't help but look at mountain number three on the map. Three trails down, all double black diamonds. It would have been strange not to laugh then. I clutched my stomach and cackled. I might as well have just thrown myself off the edge of the mountain at that point. Phil. A tremendous roar cuts Tim off. We were compelled to cover our ears, and the force seemed to make the ground shake. Soon, the ground actually did begin to rumble. I fell onto my ass and saw Tim unsteady on his skis. Another terrible bellow that was somehow more ear-piercing than before. Vibrations passed through my body. I physically felt how loud it was. The hell is this? Tim cried out. The name flashed in my mind. Powdered white quicksand split and opened, and Tim sunk into it, chest deep. I tried to claw towards him, but it was impossible. The snow had a current now, and swept us away like an ocean. We were at the top of an avalanche that had formed, and were about to ride it all the way down. Before I was blinded and drowned by dazzling white, I heard the roar again, and remembered its horrible name. Grendel. There was only pitch black when I opened my eyes. Every inch of my body was securely compressed by the weight of all the snow. Claustrophobia gripped me, and my breaths became shallow and rapid. Though I'm athletic, I'm a bit of a nerd, too, and indulge in a lot of online articles and forums like this. 
I had read a few stories of skiers caught in avalanches and how they were able to survive. I focused on one of my fingers and flexed it repeatedly until there was a millimeter of space for it to wiggle around. Kept going until there was a centimeter of space, and then an inch, and so on. A slow, tedious process made excruciating by my lack of air. Forever went by before I was able to reach my face to clear space for breathing. My nose and mouth were unobscured now and allowed me to take shuddering breaths. I gathered as much saliva as I could and spat it out. My eyes were barely adjusted and I could make out the spit hanging on the snow in front of me. It fell right back onto my face and I groaned, trying to blow it off. Now I was oriented, thankfully. I wasn't upside down in the snow and only had to dig forward to reach the top. Grendel's howl shook the snow around me and, funnily enough, helped me further free myself. Grendel sounded far, but it would take a long time to escape from the snow. I dug until my hands ached and dug some more. I punched my arm through the final layer of snow and felt the wind blowing at my arm. Gingerly, I pulled myself onto the large bank of snow, careful not to upset it and cause further shifting. I'd pulled myself along on my belly until I found more stable grounds to stand on. Another one of Grendel's roars, closer now, caused the hole I had just dug out of to collapse. A blue sky caught my eye, sticking out further down the cascade of snow. Tim. I hurried over and began desperately shoveling with my hands. He was upside down. Halfway through digging, I could tell his body was twisted the wrong way. I was moaning to myself. When I got to his chest, I renewed my efforts after I saw it rising feebly and falling. Somehow, he was still breathing. And alive. As carefully as I could, I tried to pull Tim from the snow. His whole body, including his fingers, were frozen up like in those street fight videos, when someone gets knocked out bad. Still, his chest rose, indicating life. It's okay, Tim. I've got you. Come on. We're going home. It's okay. I'll carry you. The state I was in then was indescribable. Catatonic, almost. My choice to deny reality and retreat back into my head it kept me from collapsing. I don't know how, but I dragged Tim for what felt like a mile. I don't know how long it took, but every five minutes or so, another one of the Grendel's earth-shattering roars urged me on. They continued to get louder. At the time, I didn't know where we were but I assumed the avalanche had carried us all the way down somewhere on mountain number one. I would occasionally look behind me, back to mountain number three. Something was descending it. Trees were being mowed down by something obscured in a big cloud of snow produced by its movements. It was enormous. A lake's worth of snow dislodged and developed into another destructive avalanche. It carried off towards the opposite side of the mountain and away from us. Eventually, I encountered the skiers. I fastened Tim's goggles onto my sightless eyes and made sure neither Tim nor I had any skin exposed through our winter clothes. I followed the rules exactly, aiming my head down and avoiding any contact with them. The trembling marionettes wobbled past us every time, all the while I dragged my poor brother. I saw Russ again. Same burgundy snow pants, same frost-tipped goggles, same winter jacket with the zipper missing. He jangled along with the rest of them, and I made no move to capture his attention. I'm glad Tim wasn't awake to see him. It. Seeing Russ must have triggered delirium, as I kept company with myself the rest of the way by talking to the voices that now echoed and bounced around my cranium, all in ridiculous cartoonish accents. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Cold, no? How'd you get down? You tell me. It's probably just me, but Tim's neck's kind of funny looking. Ha! Huh? Just keep on swimming. Just keep swimming. Look behind you. Don't do it. Peeking at me from around the next bend was the lodge. Even in the midst of my psychosis, I knew that's where I needed to go. There were a few skiers milling about the peak, but we passed by with no issue. 
I closed the lodge door behind me, kicking it for good measure. Tim was twisted like a pretzel in the middle of the room. My eyes kept wandering around, looking everywhere except at him. I refused to acknowledge it. Alrighty, Tim. You hang here. I'm gonna look around for anything that'll help us. His answer was his faint, ragged breaths. His chest barely looked like it was moving. I shuffled around the internal perimeter of the room, sifting through desks and cabinets looking for God knows what. Eventually, I reached the door to the bathroom. We didn't bother looking inside the bathroom the first time we entered the lodge, rather opening the door, glancing at it, and quickly forgetting about it. Now, I walked inside and looked around. Tucked away in the corner behind the open bathroom door was a small entryway. My phone still had battery, and I let the flashlight wash away the shadows lurking within it. The entryway led to a long rectangular room, clearly meant for storage. Four extra sets of skis and ski poles rested against the wall, a massive suitcase-sized first aid kit on top of a wooden sled on the ground, and boots, helmets, a broken pair of goggles, and a flare gun were scattered unceremoniously about the floor. A small wooden chest sat at the end of the hall-like room. I grabbed the flare gun and held it up to my eyes, inspecting it to see if there was ammo inside. It's a surprise I didn't set myself on fire, but again, I wasn't exactly lucid. I'm extremely unfamiliar with guns, and I couldn't tell anything from looking at it. The flare gun went into my coat pocket. I made my way to the chest, and after failing to open it the first time, pried it loose with one of the ski poles on the wall. With a pop, the rusty lock dropped heavy to the floor. Inside were three things. A dull revolver that at some point used to be a polished silver. A copy of the rules for the resort, and it would look like some sort of walkie-talkie or satellite phone. The voices in my head quieted. It could all end right here. I had a vision of a helicopter lifting us up into the air, and I snatched the phone aggressively, trying to figure out how to use it. There were lots of buttons, and I attempted to dial my mom's phone number, but it wouldn't allow me to input that many numbers. Luckily, focusing on the phone gave me a foothold back into reality. Unfortunately, I had no idea how to work one of these things. I put it down for a second and grabbed the revolver. Its bullets were visible, and in juxtaposition with the gun they resided in, light glistened off the tiny metal in the cylinder. Feeling more comfortable with its weight in my grasp, I held onto it. If only we had known about this room before everything went to hell, I'm sure things could have turned out a lot better especially with an extra set of rules. It was an exact copy of the previous one, and I refreshed my memory. In case you forgot, I'll provide them again here. Mountain Rules for Three Kings Ski Resort Mountain Number One One. This cabin is your only haven in the resort. Be sure every window and door is always closed and secured. Always know the quickest route back here from wherever you go in the resort. This is Ski Patrol Headquarters, and where you will find help. 2. Ignore the skiers. They are mostly harmless unless directly interacted with. Avoid contact at any cost. 3. Never remove or adjust any clothing while in direct line of sight of any skier. They will know you are not one of them. 4. Be mindful, and remember the outfits your party is wearing. It is easy to lose track of friends and mistake a skier as one of them. This could be a grave error. 5. If a skier notices you, attempt to break its line of sights on you, or find a member of Ski Patrol to assist. 6. This mountain is the safest and quickest way back down to the base. It's a relatively easy black diamond, but once you start, the hunt begins. Do not let them catch you. Ski Patrol will not be able to help. Mountain number two. One. Never go down any trail on this mountain alone. If you do, it is best to stop skiing immediately and wait for someone to find you. Ski Patrol will routinely ski down the trails to ensure your safety. 2. 
If you notice you've been on a trail for longer than five minutes, immediately stop and cut through the forest until you reach another trail. Continue skiing from there. No trails on this mountain should last longer than five minutes. 3. If the forest begins to make noises, make your way to the mountain's lift as quickly as possible and leave immediately. If this is not possible, don't trust any sounds or voices you hear. Wait for a member of ski patrol to find you. If anyone else approaches you, flee. The forest will send imposters. 4. Do not stay on the mountain for longer than 20 minutes. You will not make it back. Mountain number 3. 1. Ski patrol does not patrol this mountain. They cannot guarantee your life, even if the rules are followed. 2. Ski at the risk of annihilation. If you choose to visit this mountain, ski slowly and deliberately. There is no room for error. 3. Total and utter silence is required. If you need assistance, do not call for help. If you are injured, do not scream. Make your way as quickly and quietly to the lift as possible, and leave. Waking Grendel up would mean the end of Three Kings Ski Resort. 4. This cabin will not protect you if Grendel follows you. What wasn't on the original copy was a crowded string of numbers written in different handwriting at the bottom of the page. I made the connection quickly and punched the numbers into the phone. They fit. The phone began to ring. I was shaking at each time a ring ended its shrill cry. I feared I would hear a line disconnect sound. It rang 27 times before I heard a click. Static. Hello? Is someone there? Hello? Can you hear me? I noticed a large button on the side of the phone and held it down. My name is Philip, and me and my brother, we need help. Please, hear me. I let go of the button. The static greeted me again. And then another click. Three short beeps. And finally, silence. Suddenly, I felt hot. My fist went through the wall with little resistance, and I screamed. I yanked my arm free and turned, smashing the junk lying on the ground with ferocious kicks, and grabbed the phone and hurled it into the bathroom shattering the dusty mirror hanging over the sink into a spiderweb of glass shards. Deafening rage consumed my senses, and I allowed it to encompass me completely. From my coat pockets, the revolver fell and bounced off the floor. Without much thought, I picked it up and placed it under my chin. Snug around the trigger, my finger flexed lightly, teasing it. There was a party popper in my hand, and if I pulled hard enough, confetti would go flying in the air, and everyone would cheer and shout, Happy New Year, and the party could go on and on. The phone was ringing. For a second, I couldn't hear it over the sound of my pulse pumping through my ears. I dropped the gun and scrambled to the bathroom. I cut my hand on shattered glass, snatching at the phone, but I barely felt it. I pressed the green button, and after a few long seconds, I heard through static. Boy, what the hell are you doing on those mountains? I'm going to visit Tom in the hospital today. My mom called yesterday and told me, it's time. From two states away, I replied, booking a flight for tomorrow. I love you. After graduating college, I moved far and found an unstable job, live in a rotting apartment now because it doesn't pay well, and I just checked online for plane tickets and discovered I'll have to take transit instead. I'm on the bus now. The guy sitting next to me forgot his deodorant. Four hours to go. There's no way to sleep now, so I can use this time to tell you how I escaped with Tim from the Three Kings Ski Resort. Grendel hadn't been heard in some time. Regardless, my attention was focused elsewhere. The radio phone crackled in my hand when the gravelly voice spoke again. 
You need to start talking. Now. Squeezing the button on the side, I held the phone to my mouth. I had no clue what to say, but I started with... My name is Phil. Uh, me and my brother were stuck on this mountain. Fuck's sake, we need help. And why are you on that mountain? I put all my brain power into quickly and accurately telling him what happened, stopping after we found the rules and escaped from mountain number one. Please, man, people are dead. Who's dead? One of my brother's friends on mountain number two, and a man, I, I don't know who. They came up after us. The skiers got him. Who was the other man? I told him I wasn't sure and described him to the radio. It responded angrily. That dumb fucker. Idiot. He paused. That was Artie. It was most likely the man your friend paid to get on the resort. He was grandfathered into ownership, and we warned him, but he never believed it. Even gave him a set of rules. Then who the hell are you? The man on the other end of the line paused, uncertain. You can call me Kip. I used to work there a long, long time ago, right near the end. My father did, too. Ski patrol. Our job was to enforce the rules and to make sure everyone that went up made it back down. Kip sighed, revealing the age in his voice. It didn't take long for us to realize that was not possible, and it took far longer for the ones above us to put an end to the madness. You're in the lodge now, yes? Yeah. So, it is real. I'm not schizo and losing my mind. I'm sorry, lad. This is no dream. At a loss for words, I barely managed to ask. How? Well, that even my father couldn't tell me. What he knew was the group of entrepreneurs involved with its creation laughed off the stories of the Arapaho tribe. Throughout their people's many journeys into the Rocky Mountains, they encountered these mountains only once. On the caravan of fifty that traveled up, none but a young man was able to return to the tribe and recount his story. He told them those peaks belonged to the three kings, and there they slept. They had awoken one of them, resulting in the decimation of his caravan. He gave them names. The one that had slaughtered his tribesmen, he called Sai Sai, adapted from their word for serpent. The original names for the other two kings I can't recall, but the entrepreneurs took it upon themselves to rename them. Drakkar and Grendel. I allowed Kip to continue. All of the evil on that mountain likely relates to them. Those men, they knew the probable consequences. Even mocked them when they named the place. Wasn't too long before we disturbed another. I was there. The slopes were painted red, and Drakkar took my father the day the Three Kings resort closed. It was Kip now who had nothing to say. He had released the button, making a static return, and I let it sing its crackly tune. I felt worse. Reality clicked in my head, focusing in like a camera image finally stabilizing to reveal the hard edges under all the blur. I felt horribly human, weak and powerless against my situation within the domain of these things. Are you there, Phil? Pressing the button on my radio, I responded. Please, help me, Kip. I will. Did you find my gun? It should still be there. The revolver was on the ground behind me, and I twisted to pick it up and hold it firmly in my hand. Yeah. Bullets. Yes. Good. They're silver. You can manage the skiers with that. I spun the cylinder. There were five bullets inside. There's no safety. So careful with that trigger. I can come to you, but you're gonna have to make it down that mountain yourself. Those are the rules. What if... 
This time, I could tell Grendel was upon me by the magnitude of his atomic scream. An unstoppable force had reached the lodge. With my fingers still on the radio's button, Kip was able to hear the bestial roar that rattled the fragments of broken mirror around me. I jumped to my feet and ran into the main room of the lodge aiming for one of the windows. My fingers slipped off the radio and from it spewed Kip's delirious voice. What is that, boy? What have you done? No. No. Reaching the window, I peeled away the curtain and set my eyes upon the last king of the mountains. Skiers flew across the snow outside and past the lodge, in clear attempts to flee the humanoid. Their erratic movements had intensified tenfold and their entire bodies spasmed, urging them forward, away from him. In my hand, the radio crackled for the last time. You've condemned us. And then, three short beeps. Hardly noticing, my mouth agape, I tried to wrap my head around Grendel's enormity. The king's knees cleared the treetops, and his arms hung below him. A thin coat of frost-singed fur sprouted from skin that resembled cracked stone. These fissures in the skin, what I now realize could only have been scars, reached all over Grendel's body, and some were carved across his awful face. The blue stars burning in his eye sockets searched through the skiers, scattering like ants, and with shocking agility, plucked one between his pillar-sized fingers. The skier looked like an animal caught in a trap. Its attempts to escape became feral. Grendel lifted the squirming skier and held it up to his eye. With his other hand, Grendel placed his fingers around its head, restricting its movements, but not stopping them. Once again defying his appearance, Grendel delicately removed the face coverings of the skier. Still a good sixty meters or so away at the time, I'm not able to know for sure what I saw under the balaklava of the skier. For certain, its head was hairless and as pale as the snow that began to fall. What I can't believe was how its skin seemed to be layered, almost scaly. Grendel was not interested, it seemed. Annoyed at the writhing thing in his fingers, he squeezed until it popped. The skier stopped moving, and the lower half of its body fell the long distance to the ground. Apathetic, Grendel tossed the rest of the skier off the mountain. Megalophobia gripped me and I likely would have waited in frozen terror until Grendel tore off the roof of the lounge if Tim hadn't said something. He didn't say any English words. It was more of a... <sighs> Tim was still, for the most part, unmoving on the floor. His finger twitched, almost at me, almost beckoning. I headed right for the bathroom closet again, skipping over all the mess, and picked up the sled with a cartoonishly large first aid kit on top of it. I was going to leave when I noticed some rope in one of the dark corners, along with an extra pair of ski poles. I grabbed the rope, sled, and first aid kit, and left back to the main room. Tim was heavy, and not knowing the extent of his injuries, I tried to be as cautious as possible when hefting him onto the wooden toboggan. I secured both Tim and the first aid kit onto the toboggan, leaving a little extra room to pull the sled with. The weights in my pocket reminded me of the revolver and flare gun. I got my skis on and headed to the window one last time. It had been ominously quiet. A blue sun stared back from behind the curtain. Grendel's eye gave off a strong enough light that I winced against it. The window exploded as he forced his massive hand through it, splintering the wood frame and causing the wall to heave. I ran back to Tim and the sled, screaming. Heaving towards the door, the rope cut off the circulation to my fingers as I pulled with all my strength. A groaning log from the roof crashed onto the spot where Tim lay a second ago, and the roof soon caved in with it. Outside the lodge with Tim in tow, I could see Grendel squatting 
His hand shoved through a wrecking ball-sized hole in the side of the small building. Immediately, he saw me and rose to his full, staggering height. The lift wasn't running, and I pushed past it almost at the beginning of the slope now. Dragging the toboggan slowed me down considerably, and one of Grendel's steps halved the distance between us. When I pushed off the edge of the slope and started down the mountain, the final rule from mountain number one pushed to the front of my brain. I quickly scanned the trail ahead of me and the surrounding forest for signs of the impending hunt. Our speed was increasingly rapid, and the sled began to inch ahead of me. A crashing from behind us indicated that Grendel was still in pursuit, on all fours and pawing down the mountain after us, like a gigantic lion hunting zebra. With Tim now pulling me down the mountain and no way to steer, I held on to the rope and prayed. Skiers started pouring out of the forest in a human tsunami, spilling out into the trail and converging behind me as a horde. I bet it looks pretty funny, like in the old timey slapstick movies. A three-way chase down the side of a mountain, Tim and I in the lead with our extra speed from the toboggan, followed by what looked like 100 skiers, and bringing up the rear, a giant. All we needed was some silly music. A handful of the skiers were too slow and wordlessly ground to meaty pulp by Grendel as he dragged himself down the slope with his fists. We were about halfway down the mountain. In front of me, the ropes still held Tim and the first aid kit tightly to the toboggan. Tim's goggles and mask covered his face, and I wondered if his eyes were open. I didn't notice at first because I was going so fast, but the trees bordering the trail had new attributes. What seemed like long, white tubes, as thick as the trunks themselves, hung from and intertwined amongst the branches. Blurs at first, I focused my eyes and caught glints of light shining from milky scales. Broad heads as large as televisions swayed from side to side, watching from above. Almost every tree had an elephantine serpent adorning its branches. They made no move to join the chase, but almost seemed to resemble guards ensuring that the prey stayed within the boundaries of the hunt. Distracted by these new beasts, I didn't see Russ, or whatever the thing was that used to be Russ, emerge from the woods further down the slope and position himself directly onto the immovable path that the sled was taking. Traveling at a deadly speed, we smashed into Russ and sent him flying up and over us. The toboggan drifted sharply to the left and suddenly flipped, forcing me to ski into and crash along with it. A hollow conk sound registered when the ground met me. By the time I stopped rolling, I was three quarters of the way down the mountain. Tim and the first aid kit had come loose from the sled. The first aid kit had sprung open in the crash and lay motionless alongside Tim. Up the mountain, the hunt looks to have been paused. All of the skiers had turned and currently occupied Grendel's attention, except for one. Russ rose to his feet. His arm and shin were broken, but he still wobbled over with abrupt movements and showed no signs of pain. His deflated limbs bounced and swung like pool noodles beneath their twisted joints. Shit. Shit. I tried to scramble backwards, but the nerves in my leg felt like someone had dragged them into a handful and yanked hard, tightening like a corset. The conk sound I had heard. My snow pants were ripped and off to the side of my now vacant knee was my patella, lodged awkwardly under my skin like a tumor. I tried to punch it back into its socket, but each strike elicited an agonizing whimper. There was no time. Russ was on top of me and holding my neck firmly in his grasp just as I reached into my jacket pocket and curled my finger around the smooth metal trigger. I felt the world's most highly pressurized balloon pop under my coat. My first thought was, I can't believe I just shot myself. The sudden stabbing pain in my ribs was convincing, but must have been from recoil, because Russ stiffened and rolled off of me onto the snow. Pulling the revolver from my pocket, I planted the barrel on top of Russ's temple. Barely enough time for him to squeal, the hammer of the gun snapped and the barrel exploded. Being too close to the gun, I wasn't able to hear for a few seconds, but I could see Russ's head looked like someone had stepped onto a plate of jello. The liquid that poured out of him looked pink and far more viscous than any blood I've seen. 
It took a moment for the ringing in my ears to subside, and eventually be replaced by another sound. An engine. At the bottom of the slope, a snow-filled pickup truck emerged into view and parked next to the lift. I dropped my head in relief and barked a laugh. Who knew a shitty Ford could look so good? The passenger door opened, and a figure covered in a huge winter jacket and snow pants hurried out, unfastening a snowmobile strapped on the bed of the car. By the time the driver door opened, the person had mounted the snowmobile and began to gun it towards the mountain. Wait! A voice I faintly recognized. Kip. He hobbled out of the driver's door of the pickup truck and reached an arm out as if to grab for the rider on the snowmobile. Don't go up there. Luckily, we were close to the bottom, and the snowmobile made quick work of the steep incline. I checked behind me as it drew closer. Grendel had finished with the army of skiers. A plateau of bodies covered a decent section of the trail, and a roar from Grendel focused my eyes back towards the king. His iris shone, and from this far away, slightly obscured by the snowy winds, it looked like there were twin lighthouses standing in the distance. I felt the snow vibrate as Grendel began to head down the mountain and towards us once again. Hurry! I shouted and turned to see Tim being hefted onto the back of the snowmobile. Can you move? The rider, a man, called to me. Terrified, I nodded and tried to stand, but my knee shrieked in protest, and I fell back onto my ass. It felt like someone had punched it, and I realized that my kneecap had slid back into place. This by no means meant that I could walk, and my knee began to swell to the size of a golf club. No, I need help. I begged. The man made sure Tim wouldn't fall, and drove the snowmobile over to me. He stopped as he got off, and I recognized the look on his face when he saw Grendel heaving down the mountain. Time for us to go. He extended a hand for me to grab. What I didn't know at the time was that the man in front of me was Kip's son. His name was Corey. Every time I'm forced to retell this story, I make a point to explain how Corey was a hero. Though usually by then, anyone listening has mentally checked out, silently labeling me as either an attention seeker or a freak. I don't care much anymore. Corey had convinced his dad to come out and save us, reminding him why he started working on the mountain in the first place. Like most heroes, Corey didn't die a good death. With everything going on, it was impossible to notice the great white serpent burrowing through the snow at us. It struck Corey with its massive mouth, nearly swallowing his entire arm. He gasped and made a terrible noise while, in the blink of an eye, the snake pulled him to the ground and coiled its muscular body around him. Corey was a big guy, and yet the snake had barely used a third of its body to securely wrap the entirety of his length. For a moment, my eyes met the giant reptiles and I felt as though it told me something in a wordless, alien tongue. Do not interfere with the hunt. As fast as the snake had come, Cory was dragged away, choking and screaming into the forest by the slithering monster. Cory! Kip, still at the bottom of the slope, fell to his knees and let out an anguished cry I couldn't hear over the sound of thunderous steps behind me. I felt it, though, in my bones and Kip's despair washed over me. For the second time on this mountain, I felt ready to... No, wanted to... die. I rolled onto my back and saw the thing that changed my mind. Grendel looked down at me from above the trees. He had no expression, but the malice that radiated from his titanic mass consumed everything. I would have rather died a hundred times to my own hands than resign myself to whatever fate the king had for me. Grendel's arm began to get larger, and I realized that he was reaching to grab me. I was somewhat able to move now, but my knees still slowed me down far too much. In my pocket, a weight nudged my bruised ribs. The revolver. Freeing it from my jacket, I aimed the gun at my target. So large, he was impossible to miss. And yet, every time I squeezed the trigger, I flinched more than Grendel did. Unfazed, 
He closed his hand around me. My sanity was a pane of glass, thrown from a cliff and about to smash into pieces on a rocky shore. I was a few seconds away from worshipping the thing if it meant mercy. Instead, I reached once again into my jacket pocket and found the flare gun. I was still gaining altitude in Grendel's hand, and at chest level to the king, I fired. Fuck you, you motherfucker! The sound was similar to a Roman candle firework. A weak red glow floated from my hands and into the scarred chest of Grendel, settling snugly into one of the deep crevices. Within a few seconds, the glow sputtered, dimmed, and then suddenly ignited. The white, bristly hair surrounding the flare eagerly caught flame like straw, and soon Grendel's entire chest was an orange sea of fire. Probably for the first time in his long life, Grendel was in a panic. In the mayhem, I was sent flying through the cold air, suddenly released from his grip. A large mound of powdery snow cushioned my fall, and from a safe distance, I watched Grendel. Beating his chest like a drum, Grendel swarted the spreading fire to no avail. He gathered ridiculous quantities of snow in his hands and threw them onto his torso, but by then the fire had spread to his arms, back, and legs. The last howl he made, then, was something you can only witness once in your lifetime. I felt the wind change directions when out of his mouth came the rage and fear of a king. And with that, he turned and fled up the mountain, now a mobile blaze traveling through the sky. It was minutes before the air was silent again. The wind whistled around the trees, and the sound of my quick breaths were accompanied by small clouds of vapor. Still, I watched Grendel. From this distance, he just looked like a giant ball of smoke, rapidly ascending the mountains. It traveled from the first mountain to the third, and eventually disappeared at the peak of mountain number three. Philip! Are you alive? Kip was calling from the bottom of the slope, still on his knees. I tested my leg for a response and found it tolerable. Half crawling and half scooting, I made my way towards Tim and the snowmobile and clambered on. The ride down felt far too long, and at the bottom, I let myself slide off the snowmobile and fall asleep in the freshly fallen snow. My bus ride just finished. I don't have time to drop anything off, so I'll just Uber to the hospital. I used to go visit Tim at the hospital a lot. So did Russ's family, as they were unable to recover Russ's body. Eventually, they stopped speaking to us altogether. Tim had shattered a good amount of his spine, and head trauma ensured that even if he did wake up, he wouldn't be my brother. Right now, he looks the same way he did on the mountain. Maybe that's why I couldn't stomach it any longer. Maybe it reminds me of how useless I was. Unable to save my own little brother. Who would go and see that movie? I'm the only one in the room with him right now. My mom and the doctors left to give me some time. And so, for the last few precious moments with my brother, instead of talking to him, I'm writing this. I can't bear to face him. My time with Tim is up. My mom came in and rested her hands on my shoulder, and then the doctors, like drones, moving wordlessly around the room, avoiding eye contact. Are you ready? One of them asked. My mom nodded. Tim ended up breathing on his own for an hour. Only my asshole brother could be that stubborn. We stayed with him the whole time, and towards the end, I held his hand. During the last few gasps, when he began to struggle for air, he squeezed my hand. I leaned forward and told him, 
You were always the better skier. Kip stayed in touch with me. We were bound, connected now by tragedy and loss. He told me stories about Corey, and I shared my own about Tim. He said that Corey was in the room when Kip was on the radio with me. He really kicked me in the ass, called me a coward for even thinking of abandoning you, and I'm sorry that those were my intentions. I told him not to worry. I probably would have done the same. Over the months, we talked quite a bit, and he cleared some things up for me. Supposedly, Artie, the man torn apart by the skiers, was who Russ's father contacted about the mountain. Soon after we left, Russ's father asked Artie to check on us, even paying extra for him to do so. Grabbing his friend, Jerry, who Kip mentioned was Artie's plus one whenever he went on his drug-fueled benders, they ascended the mountain. The incident didn't even make the news. I asked more about the kings and history of the mountains, and it would be a while before Kip began to invite me over periodically to explain. Everything he told me would be too much to write here, and frankly, I don't want to right now. I need time to grieve. Here's a rough summary of what I learned from our conversations. In some texts from the southwestern indigenous tribes of the United States, Grendel's sleep cycle is recorded as 80 to 100 years of hibernation, followed by only a single year of lucidness. The periods that he was awake for were labeled the Dread Years. He is the last of a long-forgotten race of titans that once ruled the earth. Mountain number one belongs to Sai Sai, the Serpent King. His hunters, the skiers, supposedly have the king's blood running through their veins. From what Kip knows, he says that more than anything, the skiers were entertainment for Sai Sai, while he left the jobs of protection and enforcements to his king's guard. The serpents that took Cory was one of them. There isn't much known about them. According to the lone survivor from the Arapaho caravan, Sai Sai emerged from the forest on their descent from the mountain and headed north after his attack. Mountain number two is a labyrinth, residence of Draka. There is talk of treasure at the end of a dizzying maze of paths if you can find a way past the trees and the voices. So far, no one has lasted more than a few minutes past the time limit dictated by the rules. Except on that one day, a young boy found a way through. Kip refused to explain further. I explained to him what I've been doing, writing about what happened and how it's helped in a way. Kind of therapeutic. He scolded me at first, argued about how it might encourage people to go looking for the place. Recently, I've been talking to him more, and he seems to be opening up to the idea. Said he might want to write about what happened on the day the resort closed. I don't want to pressure him or anything, but I told him that it's a good idea. And if this story isn't deterrent enough, to everyone reading this, do not go looking for those mountains. You can decide whether to believe me or not, but for the sake of my brother... Please, do not come looking for this place.